points. Okay, instead of a Leningrad Dutch, let's try a, a classical. Maybe I can get the queen swinging over to h5 a little bit more quickly. Have a bit of fun. Uh, well, see if I can just maybe break in the centre with e5. That's normally a good thing for black. Uh, if he wants to swap the queens off, then so be it. Is this not good for me? Well... Okay, I'm not winning any material, but my knight should jump into d4 with with a pretty nice position here. I could have grabbed the pawn on b2, but kind of got greedy and decided to go for more. But okay, if I can carry on playing quickly, then... Oh, he says as he <laughs> takes far too long over a simple move. Then maybe, just maybe, I can uh, can get something in this game. Okay, setting up a little cheaper with knight c2 check. Oh, wow. Oh, that feels nice. There we go. And back rank mate. Well. Uh, that was a little bit of a cheapo there. I'll just, uh, I'll show you what happened at the end of that game. Let's just go into the live analysis feature on chess.com. It's a very useful thing that you can use to to see what happened. I'll just give the board a flip so you can see it from Black's point of view. You don't want to see this game from White's point of view. Uh, okay, so yeah, we had just a a very standard start to the game, so I was playing a classical Dutch. And now Queen D3. Um, now, normally the idea behind this move is to play a quick E4. Uh, so if you're going to play Queen D3, then you really need to follow up with that. Otherwise, the queen is just misplaced on d3 and you're, you're wasting a bit of time. Uh, okay, so I just castled and ignored that. And now instead of following up with e4, which is how we should probably play this position, for example, e4 takes, knight takes, and then, I don't know, maybe I can go knight c6 here and... The position's a bit is probably quite level. White might even be slightly better because this pawn on d4 and c4 gives white a slight space advantage. I think this is how white should play the position. But if we go back to the game, which was g3, uh, and now after knight c uh, oh sorry a5, bishop g2, knight c6. Uh, th one of the ideas behind a5 is that I was hoping maybe to play knight b4 to attack this queen on d3, which is uh, one of the reasons the queen is misplaced on this square. And I just wanted the knight to be defended if it ever landed on there. It's just a useful waiting move while you see what white does. So, okay, white went a3 to prevent knight b4. And now I got in this pawn break uh, e5. And this is basically one of Black's main ideas in the Classical Dutch. Uh, just to get an equal number of pawns in the centre, gaining space, and here I'm threatening to push forward with e4, gaining even more space, and actually forking the knight on f3 and queen on uh, d3. So it's not easy for him to get out of that. For example, if he retreats the queen back to c2, I can just take the pawn on d4. So he doesn't want to do that. So he took on e5 instead. I recaptured. And then knight d5. I mean, he could swap the queens off here, but then black's got everything he wants from the opening. But the problem with knight d5 is that I had this move e4, which forks the two pieces. And... More importantly, it gains a lot of space in the centre. And the only way for white to get out of this fort is to play a couple of forcing moves. So first he takes off the knight on f6 with check. And he's still forked with the queen and knight. So queen takes, d8 is forced. Rook takes. And here we see the big problem uh, with white's play. Is that, uh, okay, he might not have dropped a piece at this stage. But uh, considering he had the white position, uh, the white pieces and the better chances to start with, suddenly it's black 
that has all of his pieces on good squares. This knight on f3 has no nowhere good that it can go. For example, knight h4, uh, you, I mean, knights on the rim are dim anyway, but it can't go anywhere from here. So pawn to g5, I think, would just trap the knight on h4. Uh, the knight could go to g5 here, but then I've got to sacrifice, I oh, know, well, just a little tactic here with rook takes d2. And after king takes d2, bishop takes g5, check. I've picked up uh, two pieces for a rook, and I've got a very good position. So neither of those knight moves going forward are any good uh, for white. So he had to retreat the knight back to its starting um, rather depressingly on g1. And that's a sign that everything's gone horribly wrong. I mean, if I wanted to here, I was saying during the game that I could just take the pawn off on b2. Hitting the rook, he goes rook b1. Oh, rook b1, I can take another pawn. So maybe instead of rook b1, rook a2. And then let's say just back with the bishop. And everything's uh, looking rather good for black. Probably following up with bishop e6 on the next go. Hitting the pawn on c4. So this would be one way of playing. But I decided to be a bit more ambitious than that. And uh, so instead of bishop takes b2, I tried knight d4. So obviously the immediate threat is knight c2 check. Forking the king on e1 and the rook on a1. So white obviously has to get out of that. And he spotted that one and played rook to b1. And now bishop e6. And you notice how a lot of my moves now are coming with gain of time. I get to play knight d4 and threaten knight c2. And now when I play bishop e6, I'm threatening the pawn on c4. And rather than take time out to defend that with b3, my opponent decided to go on a counter-attack because he didn't like his position. So g4. So it's a nice idea. The point being, now if I take on g4, he's got bishop takes e4 here. And I'm not going to say white's okay here, because it's still pretty miserable. But at least this bishop on e4 is now a good piece, raking down towards b7. And may, maybe he's got a few chances here. So I decided just to keep this pawn centre uh, nice and secure here, by playing pawn to g6. Uh, so now, after takes on f5, I can recapture, and I keep this important pawn on e4. Uh, the reason that pawn on e4 is such a thorn in white's side is because not, it not only blocks the bishop on g2, which can now only go as far as e4, but it stops the knight on g1 from going to its natural square, which is f3. So it's a, a rather depressing position for white to have to play. And obviously the pawn on c4 is still attacked here. So my opponent carried on his policy of going for counterplay with bishop f4 to hit the pawn on c7. But, okay, I, there didn't seem to be any point defending that, so I took on c4, takes rook d7, gaining time on the bishop. Bishop went back to f4, and now I brought my final piece into the game, rook a to d8. Now I think as I played this move, uh, my main point was just to... Uh, to use all of your pieces. Uh, if you look at this position, I've got both of my rooks on the open D line. Rooks love to be on open files. And here we have a lovely open file with no pawns on it. So they're very happy with where they're going to be. Uh, the knight on D4 is a fantastic piece, right in the centre of the board. And both of my bishops are very nicely placed as well. Whereas if we look at white's position, uh, the knight on g1 and rook on h1 are still on their starting squares. In fact, the knight on g1's been out, but had to go back again. Uh, so things are all going rather wrong for white here. And there's already a threat of knight to c2 check. So, for example, if white passes uh, or decides to develop the knight with knight h3, then I have this tactic. Knight c2 check, king f1, rook d1. And then after the rooks get swapped off, rook takes d1. Rook takes d1, then it's checkmate to the king, which is trapped on the back rank uh, by his own pieces. So 
I don't know how White can easily get out of this. Uh, I suppose he should probably try pawn to f3 in this position. But actually there are some rather unpleasant looking tactics here. I wonder if I can even play pawn to e3 uh, with the idea of just, again I'm threatening knight c2 check followed by rook d1 with the king on e1 caught in a mating net. And if bishop takes e3 here, I think I've got knight c2 check, the king on uh, e1 wants to defend the bishop on, F on uh, e3 so he has to go king f2 and now bishop h4 check decides the game catching the king on f2 it only has one square to go to which is back to f1 and now knight takes e3 is checkmate a rather unpleasant one as well with the king caught on f1 and the bishop on h4 cutting off its escape squares. So there were a lot of ways to, to lose this game at this stage. Instead of this, if we go back to the game position after 20 rook a to d8, um, my opponent tried rook c2 here, uh, sorry rook c1, with the idea of trying to stop my knight coming into c2 because uh, obviously the rook's covering this square. But uh, had this been a longer time limit game, I'm sure my opponent would have spotted the end of this. But when you're playing very, very quickly, uh, it's very easy to miss a tactic like this. Because unfortunately, it doesn't stop knight c2 at all. So knight c2 check. And the point is that you can take the knight off, but this allows the rook into d1, checkmate, because the rook is no longer covering this square. And it's the end of the game. So his only move after knight c2 check is king f1. And then rook comes into the back rank. Only move is to take that off. And rook takes d1 is mate. Now 